Hi, everybody. Welcome. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> now you see why Jim Steyer is such a good partner. Um, it's great to see you all. Squeeze in. There's a couple seats up here if somebody, if somebody wants one. I'm thrilled to be um, having this conversation, leading this conversation with all of you. I'm Willow Bay, the dean of the USD Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism, and uh, thrilled to be welcoming you on behalf of Annenberg and beh on behalf of Jim Steyer of Common Sense Media to a look at the new normal. To the release of this data, that I would just take a minute and talk about why. Why is the dean of the Annenberg School launching a study about parents, teens, and digital devices here in Japan? Well, as you might imagine, you know, it's an incredibly exciting time and challenging time to be leading the world's preeminent school for communication, given the accelerated pace of change that we live in. And one of the things that we are faced with is a gap, a gap between this profoundly accelerated rate of change and our understanding of it. And nowhere is this more pronounced than in communications technologies. We believe that Annenberg has a critical role to play in addressing this gap, in part by creating and disseminating the intellectual tools, scholarship, the research, and the teaching that allow us not, not just to keep pace with these changes, but to really pause and understand and appreciate their deeper meaning and their impact. So what's the gap here that we're addressing? Well, advances in digital media, in mobile devices, and the rising power of social media are changing the way we engage with the world around us, but they're also changing the way we engage with the people who are closest to us. The patterns of our daily lives have been forever altered by the ubiquity of these devices. And these shifts, these changes, are happening faster and more dramatically than any change in recent history. Um, wireless communication has been the fastest disseminating technology we have ever seen. And these changes are having an impact on all of us, on people of all ages. Smartphones and mobile devices are rewiring our most personal relationships, including the ones between parents and kids. I think we need to be clear that we, we spend a lot of time, I think, talking about kids, whether we're talking about millennials or whether we're talking about iGen. And we really can't address and appreciate the true impact of these change without looking at the role of adults in this dynamic, and specifically without looking at parents. And parents today, this generation of parents, faces unprecedented challenges in managing digital media in our own lives, and I say that because I am a parent of, of teenagers, but also in the lives of our children. We've just never been faced with this before. Our world has been, and I see nodding from the parents, yep, our world has been rewired. Only no one left us a user's manual. So to, we knew that to truly understand the impact of this technology, um, we needed to dig deeper into the media habits and attitudes of parents and teens. Because we believe this is a conversation we all need to be having. At Annenberg, we invested in some proprietary research because we believe that truly powerful conversations are helped by a grounding in factual, relevant, and timely data. And we're very excited to share some of that with you today. I want to introduce my partner, our partner in this effort, and in many ways, our inspiration. Common Sense Media is the leading independent nonprofit organization in the US dedicated to helping kids and families thrive in a world of media and technology. And for many years, Common Sense has conducted research into children's media use in the US. And what they do is they offer invaluable resources to policymakers, to educators, and to families. And their goal is to develop tools and disseminate advice to 
harness the power of media and technology as a, po as a positive force in kids' lives. And so we're really fortunate to have Jim Steyer, the founder and CEO of Common Sense Media with us today. He's led a national conversation in the United States and we're considering this the very first step in making this a global conversation. So Jim, welcome. Thank you. Um, I think it is important to state at the very front of this that Jim and I share a belief that on balance technologi technology is an overwhelmingly positive force, but we need some guidance to help us integrate that technology into our lives in thoughtful and productive ways. So what's ahead? I'm gonna walk you through the results from our Japanese study. Jim is going to come up and walk us through some of the comparisons. What's different and what's the same between families in the US and Japan? And then we are really excited because we have students from the American School in Japan here with us, and they're gonna join us up on stage to continue the conversation. So the new normal, what does it look like for parents and teens here in Japan? You know, some of the questions that we set out to answer are what role do mobile devices and digital media play in the lives of teens and parents right here in Japan? How much time are you all spending on them? Um, how much do we, do you depend on them? And how are they reshaping our family life? So how did we do it? Well, we launched an opt-in online survey of 1,200 people, 600 parent-teen pairs. And one of the things that is unique about this research is we didn't just talk to teens and didn't just talk to parents. We talked to families to really get at um, what's going on and how family relationships are being um, reshaped. So how did we pick these people? Um, I'm going to ask you the same question we asked them. Who of you has a phone, a mobile device, a cell phone, or a tablet? Hold them up. Everybody, hold them up. OK, you're, you're eligible. Anybody who doesn't? OK, there you go. Um, <laughs> that's what we found, found out. And just so you all are clear, these things in our hands are rewiring our world inside and out. And we discovered just how profoundly they're reshaping your lives, the lives of parents and teens. So ubiquity and use. As you just saw from the show of hands, it is no surprise, 90%, um, nearly everyone, 90% of parents and teens have a mobile device. And just for purposes of, of this research, we define mobile devices as cell phones and tablets, but the vast majority um, of use was around, around mobile phones. We're spending hours a day on them. Here in Japan, parents, not, and we're talking about non-work and non-study, because I know you're all spending a lot of time doing schoolwork on your phones, right? Or at least that's what you tell us in our classrooms when we see everybody doing this. Yeah. Um, for uh, parents spending about three hours a day, um, students, teens on average, four and a half hours a day, and the use increases about 50% um, between the ages of 13 um, and 18. So, so as students go through high school, they're spending more and more time on their devices. What are they doing? What are you all doing on those devices? Um, Boys and girls spend their time a little bit differently. Um, on average, girls are spending a little more time with social media, and um, boys are spending a little more time on games. You're laughing. You know that's true? Is that why no. you're laughing? You're like, yep, Obvious. that's how it works. Um, not surprisingly, uh, teens don't think they are spending too much time on their phones. And more than half believe mobile devices are helping them acquire new skills and preparing them for jobs in the 21st century. Parents and teens alike feel a sense of urgency, a sense of urgency to respond to these things in our hand and urge in many cases to respond immediately. How often? Well, 36% of parents here and 48% of teens feel the need to respond immediately. And 38% of parents and 45% of teens check their phones at least once an hour. 
admit it, you do that. This is a brand new relationship in our lives, right? Cell phones have been around for a decade, but for, particularly for teenagers, they haven't had them for that long. It's, and I characterize it as kind of the hot and heavy stages of a romance, right? They leave us feeling a whole lot of emotions. I'm not gonna get any further with that analogy because this is a family group. But they leave us feeling connected, important, in control, validated. They also can leave us feeling tethered, always on, and even a little anxious and concerned. And take that phone away? Well, we asked teens how they would feel without it. Only a quarter thought they'd feel OK. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to ask you all that question, too, so just be prepared, because I'm curious as to how you, you all feel if you, took, if you took your phones away. What's also going on is we are watching the world around us engaged in their phones, right? We see this going on at home. Parents are watching their kids' faces buried in their phones. Kids are watching their parents' faces buried in their phones. How many of you have seen this before? Yeah, in your own? Yeah. Um, it's become an increasingly familiar scene. We asked parents and teens if they felt dependent on their devices, and we asked them if they felt addicted. And then we asked them to comment on how each other felt, how they thought the other felt. So we asked teens, think your parents are addicted? And we asked parents the same thing. So when we talked to teens, 45, just about half of them, say they felt addicted to their mobile devices. And 27% of Japanese teens felt their parents are addicted. We asked parents, same question. 38% of parents said, mm, I feel kind of addicted to my phone. 61% um, of parents felt their teens are addicted to their mobile devices. So what does this dependence look like? I think we all know. We all have seen the very familiar scenes of us being together, but often apart, often distracted by our devices, at the family dinner table or out at a restaurant, in the car, even on family vacations. Our data say just the same thing, suggesting that parents and teens are increasingly distracted from each other. We asked, how often do you feel, parents, that you're competing with your child's mobile device? We ask kids the same thing. How often do you feel you're competing with your parents' device for attention? At least a few times a week, 60% of parents feel their teens don't pay attention when they're together. At least a few times a week, one in four teens feel their parents aren't paying attention because they're distracted by their mobile devices. And then in a bit of research that I, as a parent, um, found a bit disheartening. 20% of teens told us that they've sometimes felt that their mother or father think their mobile device is more important than they are. And I know for all the I can speak for all the parents in the, the room, um, when I say that is not a message we hope to be communicating to our children. Conflict and worry. All of this, as you might imagine, is leaving parents a bit concerned. Kids seem a little less troubled by it. 23% of parents feel device use has hurt their relationships. And parents of younger teens worry more about their kids' device use. Um, it's also a source of argument in some homes. OK, tell the truth. How many of you in your house argue with your kids about their device use? Well, rel interestingly, relatively few here in Japan say they do. It, 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 and Jim will, Jim will explain this. It's really an, more of an American phenomenon, but we may just be more candid about it, or we may just be more argumentative. 19% um, of parents and 12% of teens here in Japan say they argue about device use on a daily basis. Um, and again, we'll see how different that looks in the US. So 
This, this sort of concludes our look at what's going on for Japanese teens and parents. And I'm going to have Jim come up and present the comparison data um, that we, our findings when we compared <coughs> the work that we did here in Japan with the work of Common Sense Media. Thank you. Okay. Konnichiwa. Arigatou gozaimashita. I have now exhausted my entire Japanese uh, repertoire. Um, first of all, I want to say it is an honor to be up here with Willow Bay, uh, who is not only a great partner, but the dean of truly the finest communication school in the United States and the world. And I want to frame that as, I mean that. And, and what she failed to mention is I'm a Stanford professor. So that is really hard for me to admit, particularly given the failure of the Stanford football team about 10 days ago <laughs> in, in Memorial Stadium, which we will not mention. If anybody brings that up, they will be ejected from the room later. OK, but one other, one other housekeeping thing. I know you guys are taking photos and stuff, but I do this in my Stanford classes. I, my day job is I run Common Sense Media, but I've been a professor at Stanford for actually 30 years. Um, I do not allow laptops or phones in my classroom because I don't think people pay attention. So I would actually like you to put your, if you have one out, I want you to put your phone or your laptop away. And for the students who are taking notes, remember this, called a pen, you can write on it, you can write with it. <laughs> and I think I do this in my class. Because we really want you to be part of this discussion. If you look at the data that Willow just presented, it's a, such a huge deal. This is really, it's not just a device. It's not just technology, which as Willow mentioned, we both believe used appropriately can have a tremendously positive impact on all of our lives. But this is changing our lives, our families, our cultures, our society. And at Common Sense, we, we have largely for the first decade or more of our of our existence focused on the United States. But now in partnership with Willow and Annenberg, we're looking at this globally. And when you look at the data about Japan versus the United States, you see this is a phenomenal issue everywhere. I mean, literally, I went out, walked out yesterday to a, new, a ramen shop. And you know, 90% of the people were on their phones while they were eating their noodles. And you think about the fact that 10 years ago, 10 years ago, that did not exist. And it's a phenomenal change in so many different aspects of our society that impacts each and every one of us in this room, but so many different aspects of our culture and our society. We are conducting the greatest social experiment in our life, certainly in my lifetime and in Willow's lifetime, with virtually no research, no advanced knowledge, and at warp speed, being led by extraordinarily talented technology engineers and companies where we haven't always thought through the impact, both positive and negative, of what these devices and these platforms mean. <clears throat> so this is a conversation, as Willow said, that we think is incredibly important. And the reason we're framing today's around young people is because we feel not only are they digital natives, but they understand the technology. They are the IT professionals in my house and Willow's house. My kids have to fix everything we have. And, um, but also, they are the people who are going to chart the course of the proper and balanced use of devices and technology. Uh, we have a colleague at Common Sense. So at Common Sense, we rate every movie, TV, video game, website, book, music. We have about 80 million users for consumer reports for media and technology for kids and family. But we also have a schools program now that's in almost every school in the United States about what we call digital literacy, which is the safe, ethical, responsible use of devices, bullying, uh, how people form their identity, privacy, respect, all sorts of different issues. Driver's ed for the internet is what it really is. And, and we start teaching it in first grade in, in, in the school of the United States. And we built the curriculum with a colleague of mine uh, at Harvard. We call Harvard the USC of the East, by the way, for all you, tro <laughs> for all you children. They love that. By the way, I tell you, when I say that in Cambridge, they love it when I call Harvard the USC of the East. But, um, but I will tell you, so Howard Gardner may be the greatest child development expert in the United States. And he gave, when we first started building this together, we gave him an award at the Kennedy Center in, in Washington, DC. And he got up in front of this large audience and he said, this is like the printing press. 
He said, this is not TV, this is not music, this is like the invention of the printing press back in the 1300s or 1400s, whatever year it was. It will change everything. And I think he's right. And I think the impact it's having on all of our lives, in all aspects of our lives, is simply phenomenal. So let's, and I would say we also ignore that impact at our peril. So let's look at the comparison, then let's have our, our young people come on up and tell us what, what they really know about all this. Take a look at figure number one. Very interesting. I mean, 80% of kids in the United States check their phone at least hourly. This is a big bone of contention for me with our four children because A, there's no devices allowed at the dinner table, and we have really strict rules about when you're allowed to have your phone out and stuff like that. But they have to answer a text. Why? But look at that. Eight, but you're talking four out of five kids feel they have to automatically respond. And look at parents in the United States. Seven out of 10 feel they have to immediately respond. That's an addiction. That's compulsion to me. Much lower figures for the United States. Be very interesting to find out from the kids why they think that is true. So that's one quite substantial difference between the two cultures. The next one has to do with time spent on devices. So I think these also are quite interesting. First of all, two out of three parents in the United States think that uh, their teens spend too much time on their phone. I think that's a low number. I bet it's actually over 80%. But two out of three in, this, in the survey that we did last year among parents and teens in the US said that. And half of Japanese parents, more than half of Japanese parents felt that their teens spend too much time. And guess what? I, we know all of you guys who are about to be up here spend too much time on your phone. So we're not even going to ask you that question. Um, but how about this one? 3x difference here, right? So Japanese kids, only 17% think their parents spend too much time on their phone. But over half of American kids think their parents do. We asked this yesterday at, when we did a news conference. And I think it's just because Japanese kids are more respectful of their parents. And I, that, I, I mean that. I'm not kidding. I mean, Willow's kids are really respectful of hers, but mine, no. Nah. Um, <laughs> but, but I actually think it has to do with the difference in the cultures and sort of the candid nature of the discussion. But, and, 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 and we'll talk later. We're doing this campaign, big media public awareness campaign called Device Free Dinner on all the major television and, and, and platform networks in the United States. And now we are increasingly uh, focusing on parents being addicted to their phone, not paying attention to their kids. We think that's a huge issue. And for all the parents and grandparents in the audience, we would urge you to take that number very seriously. OK, next one is, do we feel addicted? So first of all, if you look at that, 60%, very similar numbers between the two cultures, 60% uh, feel that uh, parents feel their kids are addicted. And by the way, I think people on something like this are volunteer a lower number. I, I actually think the numbers are higher when I look at a data like that, because people are embarrassed to admit something, sometimes in a study. And 40% and, and of Japanese parents think that they are addicted to their mobile devices, as opposed to about three out of 10 in the United States. So here's what I would tell you. I'm not a psychiatrist. So this is not the DSM definition of addiction that you would have for, for addiction if you were in the School of Medicine at USC. But this is real. Because that means people feel this. That means it's affecting their social and emotional behavior. It means they, they feel certain angst and anxiety about having to check this all the time or what came across. That didn't exist a decade ago. That's, why, that's what's so powerful about this data. This didn't exist 10 years ago. You know, we didn't have cell phone. We didn't have an iPhone. We didn't have Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat. You know, ten, that, that, that kid from, who started Snapchat was a student of ours at Stanford. He was in diapers, you know, 15 years ago. So this has happened so fast. The impact has been so extraordinary. And just look at that in terms of the, that's a health issue. That's a public health issue, addiction. And then, very interesting how many kids, very similar, uh, kids uh, feel that their parents are addicted to their mobile devices, about, a, about almost 30% in each case. And about half of kids in each country admit they're addicted. Although, again, I think the numbers are probably higher because I think people are embarrassed to admit it. So that's a very interesting one, too. But I'd say from a public health standpoint, that's a huge issue. And from your kids and your own social and emotional health standpoint, it's a very big deal. Last one is, are we distracted? Yes. Next question. 
I mean, we have huge issues in the United States about dr uh, driving uh, while te texting and driving, right? And how about this? You can walk down the street, just go down Rapungi to, to after the, uh, today's thing and watch how many people run into you because they're looking at their cell phone. And, oh, no photos, no photos there. I'm kidding this guy. See, <laughs> this, I'm tough. I'm, I can be tough on a USC audience. Um, but, um, no, what I, this is just really interesting because parents, 70, you know, 80% of American parents think their teens are distracted, but look at the other number. That's really interesting. I think the difference there, again, is the respect, the difference in respect levels between Japanese young people and American kids, but it's still important. I, I mentioned yesterday, I have a, we have a colleague, uh, Willow and I know very well, named Sherry Turkle, who's a famous professor at uh, MIT, and she wrote a very fabulous book called Alone Together. She wrote another book called Conversation. And basically the point was, you can be in the same room with your kid and you can be not there. And, and, you, can, and, and you stop having conversations because you're too busy checking the baseball score or the, uh, or the stock index or the weather report or whatever. But the idea of being alone together has profound implications for human relationships. And I think that's the distraction issue. The other thing is just issues around ADD and brain development and how distracted we are constantly. That is a huge issue where there needs to be much greater research, not just by the Annenberg School, but by the Med School and by the School of Public Health. Because this is having a tremendous impact on all of us, and we need to figure out how to use this in the wisest and most balanced ways. So I think that is all the data that we have and I would just like to, before we welcome up these kids, say the following, and then invite them up, have a discussion with them, and we're gonna have questions from the audience at some point, or if we have time, we'll, we'll let you guys throw in some questions. Bottom line, huge cultural and societal impact for all of us. The single biggest impact will be on young people, and they are the people who will actually have the solutions, figure out how to do it this right way, and guide all of us towards the extraordinary future that we are building. So, with no further ado, I hope all the kids will come up and let's have a great conversation. Thank you. you want to stay there? Okay. Come on up. So while, while the students are making their way up here, we have a huge thank you to everybody at the American School in Japan who helped get these students here and prepared them for this day. They're actually spending their full day at the conference. Um, and they've studied all the bios of the speakers and have done research projects on the different <coughs> sessions. So Paul O'Neill, Mashiko Naito, and uh, Tina Nishida, thank you all for your help in making this possible today. And to all the parents of these fabulous kids who are here who joined us today, welcome and, and thank you as well, because we do know it takes a village. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Member. So as you remember, these... Um, you just Close your mic. Hold, you can hold that for now. So let's start with, what do you think, you all, you all <coughs> reviewed this, the question, right, before today. What do you think? Were we asking the right question? Yes? Yeah? Go for it. Um, personally, in my family, my parents aren't the ones who are typically addicted. It's my brothers. Um, older so or younger? Older. So there weren't any questions about siblings but I understand because not everyone has siblings. Yeah. Um, but in my family, my one brother, I've lost a lot of my connection with him because of his phone. And what's he doing on his phone? Playing video games most of the time? Anything. Like anything. literally anything. <laughs> Rolling through nothing. He might not even be looking at it, but it'll be going. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, um, for my family, my parents are pretty, um, they're really strict about like phone usage. And um, I guess the questions were pretty appropriate because, um, I don't know, like data-wise, like if we have 15 gigabytes per month, I use like 13. And then my parents got really mad about that. So I guess um, I am the one, like, I use my phone the most in my family. So for me, I guess the question was appropriate because I'm the cause of the problem. So uh, do problems. you feel that you're on, do you all feel that you're on your phones too much or the right amount? Well, uh, the thing is, I think um, some of us are unconscious of like being on the phone a lot because it's like such a natural 
to like a daily habit and you just pick up your phone, look at it, go through like your Instagram feed, put it down, but you know, you're, not, you're like, you're not even aware of that, right? Like, so I don't know. I feel like it really depends on how like, where you are about. So let me, let me ask Willow's question, all you guys. How many think you're on it the right amount? Put up your hand. How many think too much? Okay, be honest. Come on, put them up high, guys. That's like not a good, come on. How many, put them up high if you actually think you're on the right amount? How about you think you're on too much? High, put them up, come on. How many think you're not on it enough? Ah. Okay, but speak, but the three, guys, the three folks said you're on it too much. What does that make you feel when we ask you that question? Well, for most of us, we commute to our school for like half an hour or even over an hour. And it, like, I guess we could be doing homework, but it's... <laughs> How about looking out the window, you know? People. <laughs> I mean, after riding the bus every day, looking out the window, like, it starts to get boring. So I think we then turn to our phones <laughs> and it makes the trip go a lot faster. So again, I think it's kind of like a subconscious, oh, I'll just go on my phone because I have nothing else to do. Like, the reason why I think I'm on my phone so much is because my dad is constantly telling me to get off my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Kind of like, I'm not really aware that I'm on it for so long, but because he keeps me, probably am. So yeah, that's for me. Um, in terms of my family, so I have a younger sister and also an older brother. I'm right in the middle, and I feel like my younger sister has it the worst. She's actually addicted most. Mm. And she's and how old? How sorry? old is your sister? 13. 13, okay. Uh, but what I noticed is as I grew older, uh, the time spent on my phone actually decreased. And when I was my sister's age, 13, yeah. I definitely feel like I spent much more time. And why do you think it's decreased? Uh, I think it's a schoolwork, actually. Oh, it's you're more busier. school. Oh. I also think that my time on my phone has increased. Especially, I'm noticing that a lot of kids on my bus, like, since I'm a bus monitor, I look over little children, and they're, they cannot be without their phones yeah. or their iPads. They constantly ask me, can I use my iPad on the bus? And the answer is no, because you have to say no. They're not allowed to use their iPads on the bus. But for me, since I got my first iPhone in grade eight, it was pretty late compared to everyone else. So yeah, I do think as I've grown older, um, the amount of time on my phone has decreased. Um, I think maturity is also a big factor to this. Um, when you're young, you're like super excited because you just got your new phone, so you're really addicted to it. But once you become older, you have control over yourself. So you know what, um, what's important to you what um, what's yeah? What's important to you, like soccer events or like sports, talking to people, like not just looking at your phone and being alone and all sad, I guess. So I have two I have two follow up questions to that to you guys. To you just said one. So if you get more mature, you're older and more mature, you don't use your phone. Then how come half of parents are addicted to their phones? Sir? That'd be question. I'm being serious. But question number two is the issue you said about being bored. Okay. So I'd like to ask you as people, what's wrong with being bored and, 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 and taking time and just being there? Because I think that's a huge issue for all of you and for all of us. The idea that boredom, meaning you don't have something constantly stimulating you, is a problem. Because I think it's a problem that you have to be constantly stimulated. And I can get into brain development studies and, and we could have a human biology professor here describe what that's like. But What's so wrong with being bored or just being present and mindful without some device constantly pinging at your brain? To your first question. Okay, to my, I asked two to questions. To your first Thank question. You. Yep. Um, I mean, we were so obsessed when we first got our phones, like Ryusei was saying, because it's new. And so I think that's why parents are still addicted to them, because it's still new technology to them. Um, Whereas, I mean, it is, like, we all got them at the same time. You guys are just That's true. Like, awesome. <laughs> we all got them, at what, the they all time. started recently, so we all got them around the same time. So parents are new to the technology just like we are. 
Though I think as we are growing up with the technology, we find less of an interest in it. And I think the parents will start to lose that interest as well, but I think... When they grow up. Well, <laughs> I mean, right now we're both technically growing up with technology. Yep. We are growing up, both parents and kids. And I can tell that with my dad, uh, who's on his phone because of work. And um, so I think the more any of us at any age spends time with their phone, we'll get less interested because phones are not as interesting as human interaction is. It's not. And I would rather talk to a person than I would look at people's pictures on Instagram. I'm, yeah. To answer your boredom question. Yeah, like, I would love to hear all you guys, or several of you talk about the boredom issue. The, like, being present is obviously really important also, but I think for a lot of us, it's like the appearance thing also. Like, since everyone is on your phone, like, if you're not on it too, you kind of stand out and you feel like you should be looking at it too. So even though, even if you're not really bored, like, it's an appearance thing and you want to be fitting in and doing what the rest of the people are doing. Also to the boredom question, and this kind of goes back to what Trevor was saying about how his youngest sibling is also the one that's the most addicted. Um, my youngest brother, also, he's eight, and he's always on his... Does he have a phone? No, no, he is always, like, watching a screen or something. And I think that that has to do with... Because since we're older, we're obviously um, more, like, communicative towards, like, each other, and we're, like, doing our homework, or we can engage with our parents more about topics that are more interesting for all of us. But for my youngest brother, he understands it all, but he doesn't really have an interest in talking about what we want to talk about. So it's really easy for him to just like pull himself out and get sucked into whatever game he's playing on his What's the iPad. typical age to get a phone yeah. here in your peer group? Sixth grade, seventh grade? I got grade? mine when I was, um, mom, when was it? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> She's filming right now. Stand up, mom, and tell us. Okay. About grade eight, nine? Grade eight, probably grade eight, yeah. So about, I guess it was how, pretty late. How about all you guys, just go quickly. Um, mine was in, um, when I was in grade eight, I believe. Mine was in sixth grade. Uh, sixth grade as well. Beginning of sixth grade. I had a flip phone from second grade, but an iPhone from eighth grade. Oh. I think like fifth or sixth grade. Yeah, I had a flip phone as well, but then fifth grade what I got what um, all the way up till fifth grade, and then they broke, so then we upgraded to iPhones. <laughs> so. Well, at what age did you give your kids phones at first? Uh, seventh, beginning of seventh. We do eighth. Eighth or, in, uh, Alaska, our youngest kid, eighth, and then the other ones, they had to graduate from uh, grade school first. To justify my grade second um, flip phone, like, Going to school like is an hour away, so I needed a flip phone from after school activities like to tell my mom where I'm getting off the bus. So yeah. right, we're not shaming and blaming. <laughs> you were all right. It was good. It was good. It was good. So Jim, let's talk about the, the let's test some of the theory. So let's test your theory. Okay. Um, about the differences between um, Japanese families and right. U.S. families. So right. how many of you argue with your parents? over your device use. Okay, so you, you're a little bit different than what the data said. Why do you think fewer um, Japanese teens said they argued less? Or do you I, think that was just they weren't telling the truth? Well, maybe, um, I don't know, maybe because we might be closer to our, like, we live in a, like American environment, mm -hmm. so I guess um, the relationship yeah. between like parent and child, I guess mm -hmm. it's closer than um, typical Japanese uh, students. So if you ask a normal Japanese high schooler or middle schooler, schooler they might as opposed to an abnormal one yes, like you guys. Exactly, okay. we're we're not normal. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah, maybe. So it depends on the environment, I guess. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, there was another question though to follow up on Willows that 20% of the Japanese kids in surveyed and only 6% of American kids mm -hmm. said that basically 
their, to their parent, the phone was more important to their parents than they were. Did you see that? That's a pretty heavy number. You think that's, why would that, what, what was your reaction to that? That's a big number. One out of five kids say that. I don't think that my parents think that, but I was on a cruise this summer and, you know, there's no internet, nothing like that, and, but you can buy it for like super, it's so expensive to buy internet while you're on the cruise. And I was like, we were talking and I was like, geez, what idiot would spend that much money to have like internet on a cruise for a week? You're separate from a week. And my dad said, oh, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? I, so I just. Is your he, dad here? No. I was about to say. <laughs> but my I might say no dinner it. tonight anyway. But, <laughs> but that's my mom's recording it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, it's, it's not that we're any less important. But I also think because of work, and it's much easier, work. you know, to communicate with partners and colleagues. He's always, oh, I have to send an email, or I have to have my emails up and running in case I get an important message. So it's not that we're any less important, but I think the importance of work is brought more into the home than it should be. But to Willow's question about the cultural differences between Japanese families and American families. I said, uh, suggested, but it's speculation, that Japanese kids are more respectful to their parents than American kids. And that's a broad generalization. You guys think we're right about that? Yes. <laughs> well, um, I think, um, well, f from like way back in time, um, family system in Japan, it's like the father is the like most, I don't know, important, and then it's the mother, and then it's like the, uh, male children and then the I guess the like the difference in level of like importance or like I don't know how like important you are in the family like it's just that's a strong um, difference in Japanese culture back from like like way back in time so I think I guess that culture still kind of exists in the um, in Japan today so maybe I get, yeah I think that might be right Um, one difference that uh, I noticed uh, amongst my um, Japanese friends and my um, ASIJ friends is that ASIJ friends we use um, well, uh, well, I personally and a couple other friends we use Facebook and then we also use Twitter and we also use Instagram and we also use Snapchat and sometimes people use Tumblr and so we have all all like um, just a big list of social media um, media that we have to attend to often. Um, on the other hand, my friends in Japanese schools, they don't use Facebook. Um, the majority of their time is spent on Twitter and Line. And I also use Line, so that's another thing that adds to thing. So um, I think just Japanese people spend a little, like that's just one difference that I notice. Um, Japanese people just probably don't spend as much time on their phones because they have less things. Well, my friends have less things to focus they on. Few, they have fewer options of things to use on their phone or they're spending their time in other ways? I think it's like fewer demand, like going to ASIJ, we all have to have our own personalized computers and I think second graders now have their own iPads and it's like a very young age, you have to have your own personalized device and I don't think that's the case for Japanese schools and so the demand is less, therefore they're on their phone less or whatever device. Also in well, for us, since we all go to an American school, like Koa was saying, we have a bunch of different social media platforms that we all need to pay attention to all at once. Why do you have to pay attention to them all at once? Stay connected. Yeah, you gotta yeah, just stay in uh -huh. it. <laughs> also, like some school clubs or like school news shows on Facebook, so you need to be on Facebook for school purposes. So. Oh, I get it. I'm sure that's right. You're always on there for school purposes. I understand that. But, I but think to that point, that's actually true no, the way contemporary schools work, no. where much of the information that you're getting is coming through on your, on your social feed. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, I, I was sticking up for you. <laughs> I know. Like, in regard to parents, I think, like, maybe, like, a reason why, like, international school parents would spend more time on their phones is for work because maybe they need to communicate to people overseas or, like, there's more, like, of a need to use technology, which would, like, which would result in them being on their phones or computers more. 
I want to dig a little deeper into how you all feel about social media. Yeah. And on, I, I, you all have used, several of you have used the words, we have to. Yeah. We have to. We have, a, we have a lot we have to keep up. And I think that is reflecting something that I want to get at. So first, give us a sense of what you think the primary benefits of your connections via social media are. And then, but I'd also like to ask you, does it feel like a burden? Does it feel like a responsibility? First, um, living abroad, it is very important to me to keep in touch with my friends who live in America and all over the world. I have friends who live in Brazil and other like places that I wouldn't have met unless I knew through social media. So I do use my Facebook primarily to keep in touch with them and write them constantly. Um, but also, yeah, I think for me, I am big into acting and I, a lot of actors today portray themselves a certain way on social media and a big part of that profession is public image. So to me, it's very important like on Instagram to keep a certain public image just for later in life. It teaches me how to portray myself in case things do go a certain way. Um, I think it's also important in like like schools that you have to keep up with whatever's happening, like dramas or like anything funny on like your Snapchat or Instagram feed. And like, if we're being honest, we really want to know all of that. Like whatever's funny, it's like, oh, that kid did that, haha, <laughs> what an idiot. And then like, <laughs> we need to keep up with that. So um, I think um, the desire to um, know what's happening like social-wise, um, I think leads. Of phonies. Um, I also think that social media helps you in a way to like understand what's happening with your family members because my brother uh, he lives in California so I use Snapchat, um, Instagram, I know what he's posting like what he's doing right now and yeah so social media does help uh, connect your family members. And yeah I think also just going back to wanting to stay connected like I know right now, all of us, um, we're missing like a big event at school where a bunch of crazy things happen. And I, and I know like it'll be okay because I'll see it all on Snapchat later. So <laughs> it's okay that we're missing No it. problem. Okay, let me ask you a question though. I, I want you to think about this one for a second. Because Ava said that she's thinking about being an actress and you, know, you have to present this image. So we've done a lot of, we've done a lot of research on girls in particular and the images they portray on Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat. And I will be honest with you, as a parent, as an educator, I find it pretty concerning when I hear you talk about, I have to present this image. This water. How much is that? A, I mean, that's a big deal in terms of your guys' identities. That would be a big deal for my identity if, he, if I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the pictures looked right or I said this perfectly or that. I know you guys do that. And don't, don't you see some downsides to constantly uh, uh, modifying your images and presenting this thing? Don't you see that there could be some downsides to that in, in your social emotional development? That's a tough you way to no. phrase it, but I think it's a big deal. And you don't have to agree with me, but I'm saying, you know, Photoshopping your pictures all the time, trying to look beautiful all the time. The filters, you gotta admit, the filters are good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, do you, do you see that in terms of who you are and how you present your identity and think about yourselves? I, I think um, we all understand that that's kind of a burden that we have to, you know, sort of um, shape ourselves. And as Rio was just uh, so whispering over here, and I don't really do it as much, um, but there are people out there that always fish for compliments. And that's, um, I feel like a lot of adults uh, think that we... Well, like, I, I, just wanted, I just want adults to know that we also, you know recognize that side and some of us think that it's just really annoying that we have to deal with that but um, it's part of being a teenager I think well, like, <laughs> to keep yep. up that image yep. even Definitely. if we don't want That's, to go through yep. that entire yep. process yep. Yep. I don't like I think like as for us here the people that check our social medias are people that we don't feel we need to really like impress so like for me like I don't really like think about so much about how people will think when I post this. It's more like, oh, 
happy birthday to my friend or something like that. So it's more like for a personal, like for my own self. So I don't really like think about how people will think of me in terms of when I post things. Yeah. But I have noticed that looking through like social media and all these new like photo editing apps that like things you didn't even notice were like things that needed to be fixed now are pointed out to you. There's like, oh, like there's like a filter on Snapchat that like makes your eyes bigger and your face small. And like it's things like you wouldn't think about unless they were being pointed out to you, which with like new social media apps and filters, you start to realize more. So question for you, does, did the experience of participating in this panel, reading some of the studies, make you think about the role of these devices in your lives in a different way? Uh, yeah, um, I think... You gotta say yes, because there's a little pressure on... <laughs> yes. You know, um, yes. <laughs> Just in case you weren't... Clean. Well, yeah, I was... <laughs> I was... Um, I, I think I, I think yeah actually because uh, we all of us we um, check our um, social feed a lot daily and we're hourly according hourly, to our hourly yep. hourly yes um, and the thing is um, I don't know we we do it so naturally like it's such a habit now like yeah. all of us like it's we literally pick up our phone open up streaks to send it and it's done like it's such a habit and then like looking at the data and like how like the percentage and all that, it kind of makes us aware of what social media has done to like our lives as a teenager. When I was looking through your survey that you sent us beforehand, there was one question in particular that was, um, how would you feel a day without your phone? And the choices were like, okay, stressed, relieved, lonely. What would your else. answer have been? And <laughs> yeah, I, I had to go with the stressed part and so like choosing those options made me realize that maybe I am slightly addicted, so I have to control the urgencies to like pick up my phone and stuff like that. So now I think I'm more aware of that. Yeah, I'm also guilty of being in that percentage of uh, touching my, looking at through my phone hourly. Uh, and through after this discussion, I realized I like really need to mature. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and the asking, like, are you addicted to your phone? I know that, like, nowadays, like, one of the worst things that can happen to you is, like, oh, I left my phone at home today. Yeah. <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> and then people are like, oh, that sucks. Um, <laughs> um, when Rikako brought up that question, I said happy when I don't have my phone. Because I go to a camp where we have no technology, no yeah. phones allowed, and I went for two months no phones, and it feels so good. Yep. But yeah. what she was saying about um, leaving your phone at home, I get stressed about that because I know when I get back home, I'm gonna have like 15 missed calls from my mom, <laughs> and it's gonna be like, where are you? And then I know I'm gonna get in trouble. So like, I think that's the part that makes me stressed about not having my phone is my parents being like, okay, my daughter's dead. Like, <laughs> so. You know, it's really interesting because we had this conversation yesterday uh, when we first released the report about, and I think both Willow and I would agree, that actually that young people, in particular, the most important generation to, dis to define over the long term how, this is, how these technologies are going to be used appropriately or not, but also that things are moving in the right direction. Uh, and I said, you know, I wrote a book five years ago called Talking Back to Facebook, which was about the social, emotional, and cognitive development impacts of media and social media and technology on kids and fairly controversial book and at that point it was seen as quite critical now it is absolutely accepted as being wow this is a really big deal but it, that to me it's the conversation you're having and even your answers to Willow, willow's questions that are so important because at the end of the day the genie's out of the bottle Technology is a very big part of all of our lives. It's part of your grandparents' lives, right? It's not going to go away. The question is, how do you use it wisely and positively and find the right balance? And, and we have an enormous, that change? Yep, and we have an enormous amount of faith in your generation right. um, to help lead the way forward integrating technology thoughtfully and productively. So thank you thank all. Thank you so much. You were fantastic. Thank you, thank you for having thank us. You. Stay here, stay here.
And by the way, thank you to, again, to the, to the American School in Japan, but also to your parents. Way to go, parents. Nicely Thank done you. here. An extraordinary group. So thank you all for joining us at, at what we hope will be um, an ongoing and recurrent and global conversation. And enjoy the rest of the Thank you.